show is a dialogue between the host and the listeners about their relationships. This show is not an attempt to assess, diagnose, or treat any mental health or illness condition. Please consult your physician, psychiatrist, or psychotherapist for personal matters. Inner Voice, a heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, and I have Sean in studio. This is a show about what matters most in our life, our mind, our thoughts, our feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. In this show, I'll bring you the latest research about the grief process of losing a close friend. And then I am so excited to have Dr. David Burns, an adjunct clinical professor emeritus at Stanford University, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science with me. And he is the author of a best-selling book, Feeling Good, the new mood therapy. You can call us on the studio line if you like to talk to me or we would like to talk to Dr. Burns. Um, 951-922-3532. We'll be right back with the tip of the week. Hello, I'm Dr. Fujian, and I have great news for you. I'm offering a special time-limited offer to anyone who's interested in online therapy or coaching sessions. I've developed the Awareness Integration Model, which allows in only 12 weeks to raise your self-esteem and confidence and let go of your thoughts and emotions that produce depression and anxiety for you. So call today to schedule your online session and save $600. Call me today at 818-648-2140. That's 818-648-2140. Or go to www.fujan.com. So this is the tip of the week. Now, happy belated Mother's Day to all of you mothers out there and all of you who act as mothers even if you do not have children. It is a day that you can appreciate yourself and give a gift of love, care, and pampering. Yes, yes, pampering to yourself. It is a day to allow yourself to receive all the love and appreciation from people around you. I thought about my mom and my godmother. I, um, I came from Iran when I was 12 years old. So I lived with my mother, biological mother. My parents were divorced. And then her cousin, uh, who's my godmother, oh, I get emotional when I talk about the, the, the two of them. My mother passed away two years ago and my godmother is still alive and she is in Iran. And sometimes I, you know, call her and kind of talk to her and uh, just gives me a lot of love. And I was lo looking at their influence in my life. I've learned to be loving, committed, ambitious, and giving and caring and being honest and on integrity and do good deeds from them. This is what they taught me. Each one of them gave me the gift of who I am today. Besides the two, I've had many women and men in my life who, women who have acted like mothers to me and women who have acted like fathers and friends and best friends. Their loving and caring side have made me grow tremendously tremendously. In turn, I've given what I have learned from all of them to my friends, other children, and my clients. I don't have children myself. Um, and hopefully all of you who are listening and uh, viewing us. So these conversations showed up for me. So I'm going to ask you some questions so you can ponder on them and really look at that. What have you learned and gained from your mother? How are you thinking and feeling just like your mom? How do you relate to others as your mother related to you? Because, you know, most of us learn the concept of attachment and love and caring from our primary caretaker, which usually is our mother. And maybe yours was and maybe yours were other people, just like what I said to you was my godmother. What parts of your mother you see in yourself and then you love them? And which parts of them you see in yourself and you're like, oh, I can't stand that part of me. I act just like my mother. How much of your love, how much 
of your love do you actually share and express with your mother? Um, it's interesting how much of the biological factor and the behavioral and being uh, with our parents affect us and is part of who we are and the fabric of who we are. And usually um, we just receive from them and then forget it. Or we think that we're, they're not, they weren't good enough or they were amazing. It could go from one extreme to another, but the knowledge and the awareness that who they are is part of us. And being aware of that, where we could cherish what they gave to us that we love, and we can forgive what they gave to us that we didn't love, and then have the option of shifting that and changing it to the way that we actually want. So ponder on those questions, write them, journal them, send them to me on the social media, um, and then um, you know talk to me, whether you do it through email or social media or phone calls, any of those. I want to hear from you, and I want to hear how it is for you. So we'll be right back with our latest research. Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, The Awareness Path to Create the Life You Want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. Pacific on Smart Talk KMET 1490 AM and on KMET 1490 AM.com. Welcome back. All right, let's talk about the latest research. The trauma caused by the death of a close friend endures four times longer than previously believed according to a research from the Australian National University. The researchers warn a lack of recognition about the time it takes people to mourn a close friend. It's leading in adequate, inadequate support being made available during the grieving process. The study shows that the death of a close friend will significantly affect a person's physical, psychological, and social well-being up to at least four years. Yes, four years. Previous studies suggested that grieving period lasted around 12 months, one year usually. And I've even heard from people, it's like it shouldn't be more than three months or six months, but latest one year. Like if, if it goes beyond one year, we call it complicated grief and uh, we think that there's something wrong. But this study says it's been natural to go along for about four years. The study analyzed longitudinal data indicators of health from the household income and labor and dynamics in Australia. They surveyed 26,515 Australians, of whom 9,586 had experienced the death of at least one close friend. The study found that people grieving a close friend suffered a significant decline in physical health, mental health, emotional stability, and social life. These findings raise serious concerns with the way we manage the recovery for people dealing with the loss of a close friend. Um, we all know that when someone loses a partner, a parent, or a child, that person is likely to suffer through a significant grieving period. Yet death of a close friend, which most of us will experience, one time or another in our life, is not afforded the same level of seriousness by employers, doctors, and the community at large. The death of a friend is a form of disenfranchised grief, one that not does not get taken very seriously or afforded such a significance. This is leaving people without the support and services they need during very traumatic period of their lives. The study called on medical practitioners and policymakers and employers to rethink the way they approach dealing with people's grief after a loss of a friend. I also know that um, mostly, most Americans, uh, they live apart, not necessarily with their families. And friendships and close friends become their main source 
of um, like a family friend, their main source of attachment, someone who can be with them and build their life around and share their life. So losing a close friend is as much as losing a family member. And sometimes if the person was not that close to their original family and their biological family, and they chose a close friend to be their family. And when they lose that, it has a devastating effect. So um, I hope that if you've ever done, if you've ever had the misfortune of choosing or having a friend who passed away, that for you, you allow yourself to pamper yourself, to grieve, to allow yourself to take care of you, because uh, obviously it's a tremendous and amazing relationship and the loss of that will be um hard and if you don't take it serious then you're not taking yourself seriously so i hope that you do that for yourself so now i want to talk to you about an amazing amazing person which i've learned a lot from all the time has been in my previous shows uh, within the past couple of years. Every time there's a seminar or a conference that he is presenting and I might be presenting right next door in those conferences, I come in, I listen to him, I learn from him every year. And he's going to have a new book. Dr. David Burns is an adjunct clinical professor Professor Emeritus at the Stanford University Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. His best selling book, Feeling Good The New Mood Therapy, has sold more than, are you sitting down, 5 million copies worldwide and is the book most frequently recommended for depressed individuals by American and Canadian health professionals. Many published research studies have indicated that 65% of individuals with moderate to severe depression who are given a copy of this book improve dramatically within four weeks with no other treatment. This is one book that I have given to my clients every time for the past uh, 30 years or 20 years that I've uh, actually have seen this book. Um, feelinggood.com contains free resources for all the therapists as well as the general public, including his popular weekly Feeling Good podcast with more than 1 million downloads. He has won many awards for his research and teaching, including the prestigious 2018-2019 Irma Blend Award for teaching from the American Psychiatric Associations, the A.E. Bennett Award for Basic Research from the Society of Biological Psychiatry, and his latest book, Feeling Great, yep, Feeling Great, is nearly completion and will be published in 2020. We'll be right back with Dr. David Burns. Hello, I'm Dr. Fujan, and I have great news for you. I'm offering a special time-limited offer to anyone who's interested in online therapy or coaching sessions. I've developed the Awareness Integration Model, which allows in only 12 weeks to raise your self-esteem and confidence and let go of your thoughts and emotions that produce depression and anxiety for you. So call today to schedule your online session and save $600. Call me today at 818-648-2140. That's 818-648-2140. Or go to www.fujan.com. Have you ever wished you could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand, and hit the life reset button? Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujan Zain. You can get it now at fujan.com or amazon.com. Life Reset. 
the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it. Hello, listeners. This is Christopher from The Christopher Show. Hey, if you missed one of our shows here at KMET, don't worry about it. You can go to our webpage, and that's KMET1490AM.com. Go to the homepage, click on the SoundCloud tab, and hear any show anytime you want. Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, The Awareness Path to Create the Life You Want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. Pacific on Smart Talk KMET 1490 AM and on KMET 1490 AM dot com. Welcome back, everyone, to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, and I am so excited to be to be having uh, my guest, Dr. David Burns. Welcome to my show, Dr. Burns. Thank you, Fujian. I'm uh honored to be on the show. I think this is the third third time, if I remember. Yes, yes, on different shows. I love it. We have um, a lot of great conversation, and every time I come to your seminars and lectures, I learn a lot, and um, I am so glad to have the ability to bring you to my audience. I know you started your podcast. I was so excited to hear about that. Tell us a little bit about your podcast. Well, um, yeah, it's uh, one one of my students, former students, who's a practicing therapist, uh, Dr. Fabrice Nye, approached me and after one of the Sunday hikes and said, have you ever thought of doing a podcast? I said, I don't even know what it is. And he said, well, it's like it's a like a kind of a internet radio show once a week. And I said, that sounds great. Let's let's do it. And so he uh, we, we started broadcasting from my living room. And uh, at home, which he called the Murrieta Studios. <laughs> he's, he's French, and uh, it was really it was really fun. And uh, the the audience has has grown. We just had our millionth uh, download, and wow. I think in a in a year we'll hit uh, hit two million. It, it's growing. It seems to be growing every month, and we just have a lot of fun. And it's for therapists and the general public. Of course, it's it's free of charge. And I'm, I've been going kind of through the principles, not all, only of the original cognitive therapy, but of this new ultra powerful team therapy that that we've we've developed. And it it's just it's just fun. Uh, we lost Fabrice about uh, not to death, fortunately, but to uh, uh, he he wants to do a French uh, podcast. Oh. So he kind of retired and uh, went out went out went out with a bang, I would say. And I have a new podcast host uh, in the spirit of strong women, Dr. Rhonda Borofsky, who's a member of my Tuesday training group mm -hmm. and she's a forensic psychologist mm -hmm. and, and so she's really neat we just have fun and we just do different different themes every, every week and we're also doing live therapy because so many people said they didn't believe uh, when I say that when I'm working with people I usually get a complete elimination of symptoms in one session like a two-hour session and people have been saying oh that's impossible you're a liar and stuff like that and so we've we've done some live therapy uh, which has been very very powerful and and, and inspiring uh, and we just did a two-year follow-up with the first person we did live therapy with a physician named mark talking wow. about our mother's our fathers, such important themes, and he felt like a failure as a father, and he'd mm -hmm. felt this way for many, many years, and because he couldn't get close to his oldest son, mm -hmm. and he'd tried everything, and that was his one dream in life. Well, he had two dreams, to become a great physician, which he did, uh, and to have a big, loving family. He, By the way, he's, he's from Iran. Hey. 
Really? Yeah, yeah, he's really a neat guy, and so uh, we we treated him live, and it was just blow away. Wow! It was so inspiring. He was sobbing during during it, and but he turned it around by changing his his thinking, and then we just uh, said, let's do a follow up on some of these people, and yeah. so he sat down a, about a week or so ago. And he's just on a high. And he said the miraculous thing was once he stopped beating up on himself and felt yeah. joy. And then he he used the five secrets of effective communication with his kids and said it worked instantly. Amazing. And, and he's just now has the most fabulous relationships with them. So it, I think people can respond, recover, can be cured really fast in so, many, if not, if, most, most of the time. And it, it, it can and does stick. Actually, um, in the last time we had spoken, uh, I had a lot of people on my social media that came and gave comments, obviously a lot of great comments. And one of the common was this conversation of, yes, you say that it's great, but how long does it really last? But before you answer that question, yeah. which you kind of did, but then to do it more of what it is about it that actually actually yep. makes it last. Tell us a little bit of this audience, what the team CBT is, T-E-A-M CBT. CBT is a cognitive behavioral therapy, but a team is, is actually something you created. And could you talk about it a little bit? Yeah, it, it was, it, team is based on research on how psychotherapy actually works. It's not a new school of therapy. I'm kind of think we need to get away from schools of therapy that compete like cults or religions with a cult leader and everyone saying we've got the answer and kind of looking down on people from other schools of therapy. And, uh, and TEAM are, are really the, in, the ingredients, uh, I think, of all effective therapy. The T stands for testing. We, we test patients at the start and end of every single therapy session. Uh, how are you feeling at this moment? So we, the goal is to get a, a complete or near complete elimination of symptoms in today's session, not six months from now or six years from now, but to, to make the change happen right now, if, if possible. And so at the end of the session, the patients go in the waiting room, they repeat the tests they took before the session in the waiting room, they leave it for us before they go home, and we can see exactly how effective or ineffective we've been. And this is this is a revolutionary thing. I think in the future, all therapists will be required to, to do this. You, you can't do good therapy without measurement anymore you, you, than you could have a good emergency room without using the x-ray machine, blood testing, EKG, and, and blood pressure cuff, and, and, and so forth. Uh, in addition, patients rate us at the end of the session on how empathic we were, how helpful we were. And the, the, the tests we use are extremely sensitive to the tiniest therapeutic failures or errors. And so most therapists initially, when they get their scores from patients, they, they get failing grades on all the scales from all of their patients. And this, this is very disturbing to, to therapists who thought they knew what they were doing. And in team, there are four deaths of the therapist's ego, and one of the deaths is, is, is the discovery that you're actually pretty darn incompetent. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you're willing to tolerate that, and it's painful. I told you, I just had a, a, a seminar at Stanford, and I, I, it was kind of a failing grade, to tell you the truth. And it's just painful, but if you're willing to look at that and see, here's the precise errors I made, then in the next session, you can turn it around and hit a home run with that patient. The A, the E is empathy, and and you know you seem like a very warm and caring person. You were talking about what you learned from your mother, was love and compassion, and and the, and the bonds we develop with people we love, and the the loss of a dear friend, or I might say the loss even of of a pet pet that you loved dearly can also. I I lost my beloved Obi. My new book is going to be dedicated to Obi. Mm. And we lost him about a year and a half ago. And I, I grieve for him. And to tell you the truth, I hope I'll grieve for him forever. I, yeah. uh, when I go out jogging, I shout out his, his name. I know yeah. he won't appear. Uh, uh, yeah, but, I still uh, grieve after four years for my little dog, yes. Oh, he was yeah. a therapeutic dog. He used to be with my all my patients. So actually oh, my wow. clients also grieve for, for him for the past four years. Oh, yeah. 
Wow. Yeah. So we do very rigorous empathy training. That was what I was doing at, at the Stanford seminar. The only problem is the people didn't know that they needed it. <laughs> and I forgot to establish an agenda. Would you like to learn some better ways to relate to the people you're supervising here at Stanford? And so, oh, oh well, live, <laughs> we will survive. Uh, but anyway, we do. We, we before we do anything to help the patient, we try to get an A or an A plus on empathy, which means not helping just going into the dark with the patient and acknowledging the feelings and creating that trusting bond. And then the exciting part is uh, A is paradoxical agenda setting. It's what we've learned to bring the patient's resistance to conscious awareness. That's what I forgot to do in the, in the seminar, actually, because I, I wasn't used to teaching Stanford faculty, so I, it was kind of a new new experience for me. But we do with patients. We they say, say, what do you want help with? Well, you know, I'm treating someone now who uh, tells me that he's had h horrific and prolonged abuse and ab and just abandonment as a, as a child and he, he really wants change and and his thought like so many people who have been abused is is as I'm home hopelessly damaged and, and many other thoughts as, as well and rather than jumping in to, to help the patient in the old days in cognitive therapy or whatever kind of therapy try you try to help the person change and what we've learned is that's a huge mistake because the person will start resisting and yes butting you so instead of trying to help the person change, we, we instead try to sell them on what their symptoms show about them that, that's beautiful and awesome and all the good reasons to feel depressed, to feel ashamed, to feel enraged, to feel hopeless and what those feelings show about them that's positive and awesome. And then we ask them, gosh, given all these beautiful things about you, why in the world would, would you want to change? It makes no sense. Then the patient has to sell us on change. So it's a complete, a complete, complete role reversal. And that process of, of showing them all the reasons not to change, and it can't be done as a gimmick. It has to, you have to really see it and really honor the person's resistance. It just blows patients' minds. And paradoxically, suddenly they do want to change. And then when you sell them on not changing, they, they suddenly want to change. And then when we come in with methods, I use 50 or 100 methods, it's so easy to crush that thought. I'm deeply and permanently damaged. It has so many distortions in it. Once the resistance is gone, then they can jump in and, and crush these thoughts. And recovery at that point usually takes about 10 or 15 minutes. And I'm not talking about improvement, but a, a total elimination of symptoms and not only eliminating the depression and anxiety, but going into a state of euphoria or what the Buddha would have called enlightenment. Mm -hmm. that, that's really how it works. And, it, and it's hard to learn and all therapists are, aren't going to be able to, to learn it. But in my hands, when, when I'm, I've, since I, we had our last show, how, how was that a year or two ago? It was about a year and a half ago. But since then, I actually saw you uh, presenting this and working with a client oh, yeah, in, right. in the uh, brief therapy, the live, uh, the live long one. Oh, and oh, yeah, it is right. so, I was so impressed. And, you know, I've been a therapist for 30 years and I go to all the master uh, yeah. seminars and I watch all the masters in this field. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to impress me now, although I'm, I get, you know, I'm yeah. impressed with just the um, brilliance, but I was really, really impressed with the way that I saw you work. Uh, part of what I also saw was this amazing, genuine respect and care yeah. Yeah. that I saw that you had done. Um, and uh, it was really interesting because you you confront what it's not real, but you had done it with such a genuine um, love and care and respect. Now, for example, you know I've I've seen uh, uh, Dr. Ellis. I'm sure you've remember yeah. Alan. He, yeah. he was an amazing guy. I went to New York yeah. and he did a you know he did a foreword of uh, my book Be uh, you online continue, therapy. You, uh, we, we, you, you're going to. Tell us his nickname is Dr. Tender Loving Care. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm telling you, like I would watch him and he did brilliant work in 15 minutes. Like every 15 minutes, somebody would come up and he yeah. did brilliant work. And, right. you know, the hit like the em empathy was inside. Like you could get that he loves this person, but you couldn't really hear it through his words oh. at, at all. And then sometimes I see myself that I'm like very no nonsense, very no nonsense, kind of a, like my love is there. I see, you know, a couple yeah. steps ahead and do all of that. Yeah. And then yet still when I do that, you know, some of these confrontations with reality, I see my client's face, which is like at that moment. ah, And, you know, yeah. even that session when they leave, they're all like, you know, shook, shook kind of stuff. And they might yeah. go and come back like the next session or 10 session or even leave and come back and say how much it worked for them and that, that type of a thing. But when I was watching yours and looking at how much the empathy that you just talked about and then the paradoxical part was coming, but with the utmost level, like when you talk about empathy, it would, it is there to, to the, to ev toward every single word and your voice and your tonality as it shows up and lands and creates safety for the client. Yeah. Well, I love your saying that. Thank you so much. And yeah, I loved Albert Ellis, but uh, every, the F word came out of his mouth every three seconds and he yeah. was kind of, you know, kind of attacked people for their irrationality. And so he either loved him and kind of became one of his disciples and recovered or hated him and dropped out of therapy. But there wasn't a lot of warmth and compassion. And, and, and he, he used to say that uh, empathy is not only not helpful, it's hurtful because he said, if, if you're empathic and kind the patients won't do their effing homework they'll just get addicted to you but when i did research uh the first research showing that empathy does have a small causal effect on on recovery he 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 was he had courage he said you're, you're right and i'm going to change my my point of view on, on on that but i was helped a lot uh because i i was fiery when i was young i was confrontational too and uh, what, what, what's helped me is, is connecting with some really beautiful, kindly people like Jill Levitt, who I did was my co-therapist. I mean, uh, I've, I've learned just a lot by osmosis from her. She, she's a genius and she's a fantastic. I remember you when you were fiery too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, but she's so warm. And, and then my cat, Obi, too, taught me a, a great deal about the, the miracles that can happen through, through warmth and, and tenderness. And, and when he came to us, he was a, a very violent, aggressive cat. He'd been living in the woods, you know, without human contact for two years. So, so he, he was a predator. But he, uh, he, taught, he taught me a lot about love and uh, uh, and he became very a very loving uh, a loving animal. But the the empathy isn't enough. I mean, but Carl Rogers said all you need is empathy, and then all the rest will follow. And that that is really not, not true. But it, it yeah, it's it, got to be there because it, yeah. if, if you're going to work miracles with someone, they've got to trust you. And yes. uh, and if you want to use powerful amazing tech techniques that empathic connection would be good and i have that empathic connection with you that's why yes. i love doing interviews with you i, I trust you. you i just think you're you're awesome Thank uh you. you're you're generous you're you're kind you're you're brilliant uh Thank but, you. Uh, that, it's great that. to hear that from you because obviously I, uh, I honor you and i respect you a lot there's something um People ask a lot about your work, and it's like, why is it that works faster than maybe the regular CBT? Like, what is the secret ingredient? The What I got from you, so I'm just going to throw my assumption and then sure, please yeah. correct me, that obviously the empathy is the net, like a safety security net that you could yeah. do, but then you got to build that net in order to create that bond. And then what I got from you is that you take every step of their duality, like yeah. part of what they want and the duality, which resists, like, you know, we both come at it with two ways and you're taking those dualities and making them own it as, as what they're needing to do as a strength or as something that they need to protect themselves. Yeah. And somehow when you put it in that way and you bring it and you're not fighting with it, like maybe I do as a therapist and, you know, or maybe Albert Ellis did as a therapist yeah, going yeah, at yeah. it. 
you're taking them and saying, my God, you do this naturally. This is the way you took care of yourself. This is what it says about you. And you open these dualities in that way. And then is that what the secret is? It's very very much like that. In fact, Jung said we have to uh, integrate with our dark side. That's the meaning of of mental health. I never read any young, but I've heard about it and it sounds awesome. But yes, I think you, you see it in psychiatry and psychology. We, we, we tell people there's something wrong with you, right? Yes. I, have, I used to do research on this chemical imbalance theory. And that's one, you have a chemical imbalance in your brain, which is a lot of baloney, by the way. Uh, it's not true that depression results from a chemical imbalance in the, in the brain. Or you had a problem in your childhood, or you have this or that defect or problem, that you have a mental illness. that We call it the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And they've got like 500 mental disorders now. They're everything they can call a mental disorder. And that puts the patient in a, in a one-down position and puts the therapist in the role of fixing someone who's, who's, who's broken. What, what, what I've created is just the opposite, that, that your, your depression, your self-criticism, telling yourself you're, you're worthless, you're, you're damaged, you're, you're defective, is not an expression of, of something that's wrong with you. It's, it's an expression of what's most beautiful about you, that, that your, your anxiety com, comes from what's, be beautiful, what's beautiful about you. We're, we're going to do a workshop on, on Sunday uh, at... Uh, with Jill Levitt, actually, on anxiety, a one-day workshop. If any of you are mental health professionals, well, I don't know when. The- is this is live. Yeah, you can. Yes, it live. is. Uh, yeah, go to the www.feelinggoodinstitute.com, and you can sign up for our workshop. But we're going to do it on treatment of anxiety disorders. And we're going to present a young man who, who came to me with, with PTSD. And uh, he had been locked in, in a freezer by armed gunmen. He was closing yeah. up his the Burger King, and uh, they let they locked him in there to die, and and left out went laughing. And the next morning, the manager came in early, and he w- found him, and he was still alive. But six months later, he came to me with h- horrific post traumatic stress disorder, like uh, rage attacks all night. He couldn't sleep. Panic attacks. He'd fantasize getting mugged when when he he was walking down 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 the street and then we're going to ask the audience to to show before we try to fix this guy what what do these symptoms show about him that's positive and awesome and and and, and what are some tremendous advantages for, for him uh, to 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 be freaking out all, all day every day and and it's not a, a, a tough problem but the but the answer is pretty obvious that you know if if he were to work with me, with David, and I use these powerful techniques, and he's going to be cured in three sessions, not, number one, that, that would kind of trivialize his symptoms and show that, oh, well, if we can make it go away in three sessions. It couldn't have been very severe, you know. Number two, he lived in the most dangerous part of Philadelphia near Temple University, and it is dangerous there. And, and so if his anxiety disappears, if he presses the magic button, then he'll walk out on the street and get killed. Yeah. And then number three, his his rage, he's having rage attacks, fantasizing finding these men and killing them or having them arrested. Uh, th- that all shows that, that he's not going to be a pushover, that he has some uh, moral values, that he's going to... St- stick up for himself whereas if all his symptoms were to disappear it would mean he was kind of a wimp you say oh you can walk all over me try to kill me i'll just be happy as can be you see and once i brought those things to, to conscious awareness uh, and i'd say maybe we shouldn't use the techniques do i have fast powerful techniques could could you be cured in three sessions i believe you could if, if we work together but now i think it's why would we want to do that Mm-hmm. Do, do you see? And then all of a sudden he started saying, well, uh, I don't know that my anxiety is keeping me safe. Uh, you know, maybe the bad guys can smell it when you're scared. And and yes, I could be angry for the rest of my life, but they're probably not even in Pennsylvania anymore. They're probably in Florida, robbing mm-hmm. Burger Kings as we talk. And I'm the only one who, and, and as, as far as getting cured quickly uh, being a bad thing well i've been suffering for six months maybe that's enough you see mm-hmm. and uh, yeah dr 
I think I am ready to work with you. I, I do want to use those techniques. I keep looking at your eyes and it's the screen. You're up here. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and then, and once we did that, his initial resistance, which had been intense, because when I told him I had really fast acting techniques, he just kind of started swearing at me and told me I was a fool and he got really, really angry. His resistance melted away and it really took maybe two or three sessions. He was he was totally symptom free and, mm -hmm. and, and, and terminated. But it's it's showing the patient what's beautiful about their symptoms. That's mm -hmm. awesome about them. And their shame of being depressed. They'd be, I want them to be, be proud of their depression. Mm -hmm. And paradoxically, once you're no longer ashamed of your symptoms, it just becomes super easy to treat you. And then we come in with the methods and bang, they, they work like just like that. So that's what it's, that's how it works. It's interesting because what I'm hearing from you is that um, we split as human beings. And as we split, then we we look we generalize some of our characters and behaviors and make them to be great and then we say that the other ones aren't and how do we say that is because obviously either we don't feel good about it or other people don't feel good about it and they'll tell us they don't feel good about yeah. it and um so what you're doing at that moment is you're honoring that if a human being either behaves thinks or feels a particular way there is a good reason for it inside of them. A lot and of good reasons. A lot of good reasons. Probably and 20 when, good reasons. And when you bring those to light so that the person sees, yeah, I do this because of these reasons. Now, if I think that this doesn't work, I can take on the source of those reasons and have it another way which works for me and other people and not get caught and limited to this way of expressing it or an expression yeah. of it. Yeah, I'll give you an example of it. Did, uh, you're, you might have been confident your whole life because you're charismatic, you're on TV here, you've got, you've got this new approach to treatment and your shows and everything. You've probably always been very, uh, very confident and successful. Did, but did, did you ever have feelings of self-doubt or self-criticism or beating up on yourself? Absolutely. I was pretty much uh, chronically depressed until, let's say, age 30. Yeah, I and mean, I had to go through therapy to really work on myself to get it. Yeah, well, sure. well, beautiful. So you, you had a lot of self-critical thoughts, mm -hmm. and those self-critical thoughts probably reflected your high standards, mm -hmm. and those high standards have propelled you to tremendous success and, tr and tremendous effectiveness. And look, look, look at look at you now. You 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 have a TV show. You're you're poised. You're a powerful woman. You're 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 a leader. And, and and so you, you see the same thing that ha gave rise to your depression has also given given rise to a lot of beautiful things about you. I keep looking at your eyes instead of the camera. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> and and that, that and that's the type of thing to get to get the person to to see that that your your shame your your anger your your depression the, the, this is coming from what's what's beautiful about you even hope. Hopelessness. Yes. A lot of depressed patients get suicidal because they're hopeless. And it was hard for me to figure out initially, well, what could be good about hopelessness? But mm -hmm. then it then it suddenly occurred to me, if you're hopeless, you're protecting yourself from disappointment. Yes. And, and in addition, if you're hopeless, it shows that you're realistic, that you're looking at the truth as you see it, that you've had a lot of failures, you've been to a lot of therapy that, that didn't work, so you have the integrity to, to face that rather than, than being, being a Pollyanna. Yes. That type of thing. And and then once a person says, yeah, my hopelessness makes perfect sense, this is a good thing, then suddenly they don't need it anymore. It's just Absolutely. So your book, Feeling Good, um, I can vouch for that um, before I started going through therapy, I think that that book brought me out and actually got me to go to therapy. And oh, then indeed. I went to therapy, become yeah. a therapist and all of that. And I've watched it when I've given to people and my clients. Um, and, you know, it's been uh, translated to Farsi also. So yeah, I have yeah. Farsi and I give it to people. Um, they do. They really like. You could see the uh, the essence of elevating the. You know, they they no longer that depressed, and the percentage goes uh, lower and lower. Um, how is your next book, Feeling Great, uh, differ from Feeling Good? And obviously, these decades that you've worked on your yourself and the world around yeah. you. Um, 
What are the elements that are in the book, the new book, Feeling Great? That yeah. Add to the, uh, the, sure. the other one. Well, a lot of it is similar, uh, just things being more finely tuned and the, the benefit of 40 years of research and development and fine tuning. But probably the biggest thing is this whole thing of positive reframing and the ability not only to change negative cognitions, but to change the motivation of the person you're working with. When, when I wrote Feeling Good, I, I went to a meeting. Uh, when I was still at Penn, and it was the Department of Psychology, and somebody made a comment that I just sarcastically dismissed. Uh, you know, what? But what if the patient wants to be depressed? And and I said that's stupid. You know, no one would want to be depressed. It's all cognitions. And so I I dismissed the whole issue of motivational and resistance factors, and and it's really focused just on cognitions and self-defeating beliefs. And I was going to revise it. My publishers asked me to revise it, and I opened up. I hadn't looked at it for 30 years. I said, I can't revise this. It just, it's really beautiful. You know, like, I'm not bragging, but it's so beautifully integrated. It would be cruel to, to try to revise it. But I've got all of this whole new world of powerful te te technology. And, and so it's like one plus one equals three. Feeling good was the cognitive uh, revolution. And, and then feeling great is the cognitive revolution plus the perhaps even more powerful motivation re revolution. And I'm combining these two technologies. So it's like one plus one is three or one plus one is seven plus one is seven. It's, it's vastly, vastly more powerful. This is kind of like feeling good with a supercharged engine, you <laughs> might say, or feeling good on steroids. And it uh, does... Uh uh, encompass what we were talking about, right? Yeah. The concept of how to be empathic with yourself, how to look at the parts of you that you are behaving, acting, thinking, and feeling, and look at the purpose of those, and then how those are a motivation for you to shift what it is in front of you. Yeah, it's very, it's it's very, very paradoxical. Like in working with habits and addictions, uh, I was on one of my Sunday hikes when the therapist a little overweight and. She, she was saying, can, can you help me lose lose some weight? You know, And I said, oh, I've got tremendous techniques for that. But let, first, before we do that, let's do this thing called the triple paradox. First of all, let's look at all the benefits of eating as much of you as you want, of whatever you want, whenever you want. So we came up with this list of 10 fabulous reasons to, to, to binge eat and overeat. Uh, and not, number two, what are the disadvantages of dieting and, and, and exercise. And we came up with a big list of disadvantages. And then the third paradox is, let, let's, let's see what the overeating shows about you and your character and your personality that's positive and, and awesome. So, oh, well, I'm kind of a rebel and I don't have to give in to all society's coercion about you've got to be a fan, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. Come up this big list of all the beautiful things it shows about you if you have this or, or any habit or addiction. And then the answer, well, given all these benefits of overeating, all these disadvantages of losing weight and exercising, which totally sucks, and all the beautiful things that it shows about you, it isn't clear to me at all why in the world would you want to lose weight? And then suddenly she said, you're right. I don't want to lose weight. I love eating. And then she says, and I just realized, I just made the decision to, to, to give it up and to, and to change. And that, and that was it. And then she went on a big tear of losing weight and exercising. But it's totally paradoxical, but it's not a gimmick. You, do you see? Absolutely. It's, it doesn't show up as I have the secret yeah. uh, love affair with all of this, what I'm doing and what I'm, uh, you know, uh, complaining about. But secretly, I love it. But in yeah. the world, I'm showing it as I hate it and I got to change. And that secret does not allow the movement to actually happen. But when yeah. that secret is out in the light and not it's not secret is out and shamed but the secret is out and it's like wow praise. this is really the reason the praise yeah. then you're like you move on from it you don't yeah. have to uphold right, it anymore. right right but it's hard for therapists to, to, to learn it because another death of the therapist ego is the codependent helping ego you have to give up the side of you that's committed to rescuing and saving people and many therapists 
arguably more than half uh, are not going to be able to do that in this lifetime. They're, they're so addicted to narcissistic, codependent re rescuing of, of people. They don't want to let go of, of the view of themselves as, they, as the savior, the, the, heal, the healer, the, the, the expert, so, so as to see things through the patient's mind. It's really a, a, a death of the, one of the four great deaths of the ego that, that the Buddha talked about 2,500 years ago. Uh, but once you, your ego is dead as a therapist, you, you kind of join the grateful dead. <laughs> and, and it becomes so much easier treating your patients. It's like eating candy in a candy store because people just become incredibly easy to, to, to treat. And, and all my career before I developed this, it was, it was a, a struggle to, to, to cure patients. It was an, an honorable and exciting struggle like playing chess with the world chess champion every day. But now it's not like that at all. It's just kind of like a celebrity celebration and, and it's one one session and done for me a good you know at least 90 90 percent of the time yeah. and uh it's it's but a lot of people don't don't believe it that's why i, I wrote Feeling. i did to, to be honest with you um again i followed your career for so long but watching you uh the past time you could sense this shift that has happened within you and you could really sense the shift that happened in the whole room. I think it was but between four to, I don't know, it was between four to 7,000 people. It was just huge. All, everybody was a therapist and you were doing that. And I just walked in and the sense of the room took over, which I've been to many of your lectures. But what you just said is, is this essence of non-attachment that you have to... Um, your own ego, and yet the uh, the utmost level of respect and empathy that, that came from to to the client that who was sitting there and you were talking to in front of everyone, you could sense the wave uh, throughout the room of how much um, there was this essence that. There's clarity, like a crisp, crisp clarity of love and acceptance that was there from you to the person, from the person to themselves, and that it appears that that would open up this essence of this flower um, that you talk about, which is their motivation to yeah. now get happy about wanting to do something and creating a shift. Yeah, and then you see, as you said, the joy come into your patient, and again, from mystical point of view we're all one we're not different and so you experience that because as your client goes into this ecstatic state you go into the same ec ecstatic state so it's it's like go having highs yes. one after another all, all all day long yes but it it, but it it's sad that it's so hard for for therapists to to learn this it's not just techniques but yes. something inside the therapist has to change Shift. it's a being that has to change yeah. so um we only got less than one minute when when will the book feeling great uh, be published and out for people to be able to access well you had it it'll be uh 2020 i don't know i don't once i get the contract we'll see the the timetable it's almost done now but it'll have to be revised and, and tightened up and that all, all right. takes a little time it'll be sometime in 2020. beautiful but people can go, go to feelinggood.com uh they can find your podcast also there or they can go to oh, iTunes oh, yeah. and Stitcher and get oh, feeling the, good podcast the website is the best place because there's a they're all listed now with Beautiful. links and it's searchable. So if they want to put suicide in, they'll get all the podcasts that show how to prevent suicide. Or, awesome. You know, I'm going to go check them out. Okay. Thank you so much for your time and for being with us. And for all of you who are listening or viewing us, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The Inner Voice Show is a dialogue between the host and the listeners about their relationships. This show is not an attempt to assess, diagnose, or treat any mental health or illness condition. Please consult your physician, psychiatrist, or psychotherapist for personal matters.